We are back on Taking Care of Business on Current Radio, News Talk 1180, 1230 KGEO, 1410 KERI, and now in Albuquerque, New Mexico on 1000 KKIM. And we are having a conversation with Ralph Reed, the founder and president of the Faith and Freedom Coalition. You know, Chuck, you mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood, and one of the comments the Muslim Brotherhood made recently was that they knew they could not defeat the Americans uh, militarily, so they've elected to take us over from the inside, and I think it's actually working. And there's, there's an organization called Act for America, I'm sure you've heard of, that's fighting the Muslims from taking over this country. Do you know anything about them? You know, I have not heard of them. I, I will check them out. I know there's an awful lot of good people doing an awful lot of good work out there to educate folks on those kinds of issues. So I will check them out. Yeah, right. in fact, Ralph, what we'll do is we'll send you some information. I've got your, your email. I'll send yeah, you some are, things on it. They're yeah. located in Florida, by the way. Yeah. Uh, speaking of your, of your organization, Faith and Freedom Coalition, tell us a little bit about the organization and, and where people can find out more about you. Well, I founded Faith and Freedom Coalition in 2009, and uh, I did it after I watched the first Obama campaign basically run circles around conservatives and identifying, mobilizing, and turning out such a record number of voters, particularly among young people and minorities. And I vowed that we were going to do the same thing with evangelical Christians, uh, devout, observant Catholics and other people of faith, including observant Jews and others who believe in uh, Judeo-Christian values. And we've done so in 2010 and 2012. Uh, in 2010, of course, uh, conservatives picked up uh, over 60 House seats and six Senate seats, uh, a number of governorships, including Pennsylvania, Florida, Ohio, Wisconsin with Scott Walker. Uh, you know, I could go on and on. And in 2012, even though Mitt Romney lost, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Republicans still have uh, 24 uh, states where they have both legislative chambers. The Democrats have only 13. Uh, John Boehner is still Speaker of the House, not Nancy Pelosi. And I think good things are coming. And it's very clear from the exit polling that we did our job. We made over 138 million voter contacts. We distributed over 50 million voter guides, either online, in churches, or door-to-door, -door, or by mailing them. We dropped over 21 million pieces of mail, made over 23 million phone calls. And what was the result? Self-identified born-again evangelicals were 27% of the electorate, the largest ever recorded. They voted 78% for Mitt Romney and only 21% for Barack Obama. And Mitt Romney actually got more evangelical votes in 2012 than McCain got in 08 or Bush got in 04. Now, wow. there's more to do, but what we're doing at Faith and Freedom Coalition is we're working to make sure that every single evangelical Christian in America is registered to vote, educated, informed, and goes to the polls. And in 2008, there were 17 million evangelicals who didn't vote, about half because they weren't even registered, and we're working to change that. If people want to find out more about us, they can go to ffcoalition.com. That's FF as in Faith and Freedom Coalition.com and just sign up for some free information. And, and I'll tell you, it's a great website. I've, I've, I've gone through it myself, and there's a lot of, a lot of great information on that site. Uh, you guys are to be commended for that site. Well, and it's very similar to the kinds of things that we did at the Christian Coalition back in the 1990s. I'd yes. say the big difference now is we have the power of the Internet. And we also have uh, the micro-targeting, another technology that allows us to find evangelicals. Back then, you know, the only way we could really reach them was by distributing voter guides in churches. We still do that, but we can also identify evangelical and observant uh, faithful Catholics. We can mail them, we can phone them, we can knock on the doors, and I believe it's going to be a very effective organization for advancing our shared values. Yeah, I, I totally agree. We are having a conversation with Ralph Reed, the founder of Faith and Freedom Coalition. Uh, I, I got a question for you, speaking of, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on Hegel, but, but Clinton uh, and Benghazi, do you think she got a pass on that? I mean, she, she went through the theatrics that she's done before, and it, um, it seemed to work for her. And to me, this is the first salvo of the 2016 campaign. Do you think she got a pass on this? I'd say yes and no. I mean, she certainly appointed uh, a review board uh, that, that looked at what happened, and it was very clear 
that Secretary Clinton and even above her, uh, folks in the White House should have been aware that there were repeated requests for additional security. Uh, the British had closed their consulate in Benghazi because of security concerns. The Red Cross had closed their offices. Uh, there were numerous requests for uh, additional security. In fact, one of the reasons why it took um, uh, the U.S. so long to get to Benghazi on the night of the killings and evacuate some of those people was because over the objections of the U.S. Embassy, they had removed the military aircraft that the ambassador and others were using to fly around the country on the argument that once you had a legitimate a legal government in Libya that you didn't need that aircraft anymore, and they actually moved it, I think, either to Italy or to Iraq. And that's one of the reasons why after those poor people were, were killed, those innocent people were killed, including the ambassador, there was no way to even get anybody into Benghazi because it was the middle of the night. There were no commercial aircraft. We literally had CIA assets in the country running around in the middle of the night trying to find a pilot in an airplane. Uh, so it, it was a disaster on every level. And I think even though the review concluded that those who got those requests for additional security and failed to act upon them were lower-level individuals and that Secretary Clinton apparently never saw those requests, I think that speaks to an even broader and systemic problem, which is why wasn't she told? How could she have set up a State Department management system where if a U.S. ambassador was sending cables saying our people are at risk, that she never became aware of that? You know, I think back to uh, when she, she and her husband were first elected to run the country when she did something with the travel agency and she couldn't remember anything. I think we have the same problem today. She just can't remember. Well, you know, we'll see how it plays out. We'll see if she runs. I'm fairly confident that if she does run, that Benghazi will be fully litigated. Um, you know, so we'll just have to see what happens. Uh, I don't know. The thought of Biden versus Clinton uh, in the primary is, <laughs> I don't know. It's a little underwhelming. <laughs> well, the, the, the CW, as you probably know, is that it, it, this is what people, smart people inside Washington think, so take it for whatever it's worth, is that more than likely they won't both go. In other words, Either Hillary will not go, in which case Biden will, or if Hillary goes, that Biden will stand aside. Whether that happens or not, I don't know, but I can't imagine that Barack Obama wants his vice president and former secretary of state running against each other. Hey, your organization, do you have chapters or do you have one central location? No, we do. We have uh, state affiliates now in 36 states. We have 428 local chapters. Uh, and we distributed voter education material in over 117,000 churches nationwide. So if people want to start a local chapter, either online or in their county or city, again, they can just go to our website, ffcoalition.com, to find out how. Are you currently in New Mexico? Uh, you know, I'd have to go back and double-check. I know we have some things in New Mexico. I'm just not sure whether it's a local chapter. I, I think we have a local chapter, too. I'm not sure we have a state affiliate. And I'm sure you have a state organization in California. Yes, we do. We do indeed. And uh, we have a board, and we have local chapters. And I don't need to tell you there's a lot of work to be done yet in California. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Most definitely. We're often in the two, two minutes we have left, I wanted to ask you a little bit about immigration, just looking sure. at it from your perspective. Do you think this is a political risk for Republicans? I mean, is this something that can really kill us for the next generation or two in the in the minority community? You mean if we if we act and lead, or if we don't? Uh, either way. Yeah, we're going to lose either way. Yeah, we could lose either way. Well, I think we could, but I look. I'm of the view that, and these these immigration principles are posted on our website. I talked a little bit about them on Meet the Press on Sunday. I've also sent a letter to every member of Congress, every member of the Senate. There are clear biblical principles that should guide sound immigration policy. Uh, we, we as a country have prospered because we have welcomed legal immigrants to our shores. Now, how many should come on an annual basis and from where 
and on what basis is a matter of prudential judgment. But since about 1899, and continuing on through the major liberal immigration law reform done under Lyndon Johnson, we have relied almost entirely on country of origin quotas for the issuance of visas, rather than based on what I think they ought to be uh, geared towards, which is keeping loving, intact families together and making sure that the labor needs of our modern economy are met. We need more HB1 visas for the technology industry. We need to be stapling green cards to people who get advanced degrees or undergraduate degrees in engineering and things of that nature. Because if you read Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs, which if you haven't read that book, I can't recommend it highly enough, there's a riveting story in that book where Jobs oh, meets Ra- with Obama. Ralph, I, 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 hate to, I hate to cut you off here, but unfortunately we're out of time. <laughs> read, oh, well, I, I won't book. be able to finish that. I'm sorry, but yeah. thanks for having me. Ralph, thank you so much, and we would love to have you back. You bet. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. We'll be back in 167 hours on Taking Care of Business on Current Radio News Talk 1180.